Uh, Irfan asked me to give a sort of very low-level talk for non-experts, so I, um, I hope the experts won't think that the level of the talk is a result of uh, the fact that Yale, like Berkeley, has a predilection for putting physicists in administrative roles. Uh, so, um, so uh, there really is, you know, there was a, <clears throat> an old quantum mechanics and the real quantum mechanics in 1927, and there's been a second quantum revolution. Quantum mechanics hasn't changed, but our understanding of its counterintuitive implications has changed in the last uh, 25 years. So, and uh, in the superconducting world, uh, a lot of that change started with our uh, hero, John Clark, who will be celebrating tomorrow, but since I'm speaking today, I wanted to be sure to uh, acknowledge the uh, amazing things which have come out of uh, the work at Berkeley uh, 30 years ago, teaching us that macroscopic objects objects that you know, are a millimeter across can be quantum mechanical. And that has led to uh, remarkable potential uh, applications um, in the world of quantum information processing. So uh, Scott Aronson uh, <laughs> <laughs> has a long, complicated uh, <laughs> blog post uh, in which uh, a uh, young uh, girl and her mother are having the talk about uh, quantum information. And uh, so I'm uh, here to try to give you the, f the uh, facts of the qubit birds and bees. So quantum information, which we're beginning to learn, as I said, how information is contained in quantum mechanics in ways that we didn't really understand before. That information, like all information in the universe, is carried by physical objects, in this case, quantum mechanical objects, atoms, molecules, ions, superconducting circuits, microwave photons, visible photons, mechanical oscillators, there are many different <clears throat> uh, technologies that we can bring to bear and ultimately combine to do something interesting. And how, how is this kind of information different from what we're used to? Well, uh, classical physics is deterministic. Uh, if uh, if you ignore little details like chaos, if you start the experiment uh, with exactly the same experimental conditions, you'll get exactly the same result each time. And <clears throat> quantum mechanics has some features that seem like bugs. The, the answers are sometimes random. That's probabilistic. Um, and we thought we, we got used to that. We thought we understood it uh, gradually since 1927. But the second quantum revolution involves a deeper understanding that the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, the fact that I can be uncertain about the values of some quantity, the fact that the, I can prepare the experiment in an identical manner and get a random result, uh, can actually be a feature in the program of the universe, not a bug. So why in the world would we want to build a quantum computer in which we're uncertain whether the bits are zero and one? That seems like a bad thing to do. And uh, of course, there's some funny sense in which the fact that the bits can be in a superposition of zero and one means in some vague sense that they're zero and one at the same time. And that leads us to quantum parallelism I can ha all computers, including classical computers, have input registers, some processor, and some output register. And in a quantum computer, I can put the input register into a giant superposition of all the possible inputs I could ever give the computer. And because of the linearity of quantum mechanics, it will carry out 
computations on all those inputs at the same time. That's the good news. It's exponentially many things in parallel. The bad news is that you generally get a giant superposition of all the possible answers. And when you make a measurement of the output register, you randomly get one of those. And the progress in our understanding of the software is how to use quantum interference to kill off many of those different uh, possibilities in the output register and focus the answer on some narrow set of things, which I may have to run the computer a few times because of the probabilistic nature of the answer, but I will find the answer um, relatively quickly. So <clears throat> quantum information is very paradoxical. Is quantum information carried by waves or particles? Yes. <laughs> the um, wave-like interference that I just mentioned that is an essential part of Shor's algorithm, for example, to focus the output to a very small number of possibilities and destructively interfere all the things that we don't want to randomly see when we make the measurement. Uh, is quantum information analog or digital? Yes. It's digital in the sense that uh, the energy levels of quantum systems are discrete, unlike classical systems where the energies can be continuous. If I have a, a, a quantum system like an atom with multiple levels and I have for some uh, reason able to limit my uh, attention to just the lowest two levels. I can call the ground state uh, zero and the excited state one, or in the language of spin a half particles, spin down and spin up states. And uh, because the others are maybe far away in energy, I can ignore them. So that's very discrete. Uh, and in fact, measurement, uh, quantum bits are exactly like classical bits. When I make a measurement, I get exactly one classical bit of information and no more. However, quantum information is also analog because of the possibility that I can have um, an infinite number of intermediate states of the superposition of these two discrete states described mathematically by the orientation of this spin a half uh, pseudo angular momentum vector on the block sphere. And I need to an infinite number of bits to specify the latitude and longitude of that guy. And this, and yet when I make a measurement, I'm only going to get one classical bit in the result. So that giant asymmetry <laughs> between the number of bits it takes to specify a quantum state and the amount of information I can gain about that quantum state by a measurement, that giant asymmetry is both uh, a bane and a feature of quantum information. It's great for enabling uh, quantum encryption to hide information. It an, plays an important role in um, quantum computation. And sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad. <coughs> So one way to think about uh, quantum bits is they're just like classical bits. Uh, they have two states. But, and when you make a measurement, you see which one it's in. But unlike quantum, uh, unlike classical bits, where there are only two encodings, if I in, uh, use an electrical switch, and the switch can be open or closed, and one of those states represents 0, and the other represents 1, there are two encodings. Switch closed can be either 0 or 1. And uh, those are the only choices. But in a quantum system, there are an infinite number of encodings, aka quantization axes. And if Alice has a bit she prepares in the z equals plus 1 state, and Bob uses a different uh, quantization axis, a different encoding system, how the laws of quantum mechanics produce uh, some strange transformation between those two. So if Bob measures z prime, you'll get z prime with a probability up, up, with a value plus 1 with a probability which is close to unity, but a little less than unity, cosine squared theta over 2. And 
he will say, aha, Alice gave me a bit in state Z prime, when in fact she did not. The back action of Bob's measurement has changed the state, and he has no way of knowing that. Occasionally, uh, Bob will detect Z prime as minus one with a small uh, probability. So Bob will know if Alice tells him that she's prepared the same state every time and handed it over. The fact that he's getting some random results will tell him something about the misalignment of their uh, encodings, uh, but not everything. So successful quantum systems, uh, we're just in the early stages. It's, uh, it's too early to pick the winning uh, technology, and in fact, the successful quantum computer will be a hybrid system that has many different types of technology, many different types of both stationary and flying qubits. By flying qubits, I mean photons. And uh, we need to work on a variety of, of these qubit designs, uh, not just one, even though, of course, superconducting qubits are the best. <coughs> so, oh, did I say that out loud? Sorry. Uh, so quantum information science needs um, really br to bring together ideas from uh, uh, all across the, the, the world of technology and engineering and physics and chemistry um, and material science to, <clears throat> to really turn this from sort of the toy demonstrations and laboratories into a real technology. And, uh, you know, we physicists like to think we can do everything, but actually uh, to build a serious quantum computer is going to take some engineering discipline and all kinds of input from uh, many different communities. So um, superconducting qubits have made uh, tremendous progress in terms of evolutions of their design to make them less and less sensitive to environmental noise, quantum information. Uh, the, the Achilles heel of the quantum computer, the flip side of the thing that gives it the tremendous computational power is its tremendous sensitivity to environmental noise and perturbations. The environment is observing the inner workings of the computation, and that's bad because of state collapse. Nevertheless, there's been uh, tremendous uh, orders and orders of magnitude progress in the T1 and T2 times of superconducting qubits over the last 15 years. And uh, my colleague, Rob Sholkoff, uh, is very proud of this progress, justifiably. He, he and uh, Michelle have helped uh, make a lot of that progress happen. But there's an important law of physics which uh, I want you to know about, Gervin's law, which is there's no such thing as too much coherence. So even if the coherence time is five minutes, the, the people that want to run programs on your quantum computer will want to run them for 10 minutes. It doesn't matter how much coherence you have, uh, the size of the computations you can do will just grow and grow, and there's always a need for more coherence. So that means we need quantum error correction. And of course, classical computers operate with uh, error correction, and it plays uh, an essential role. The fact that you're able to do quantum error correction, the fact that you can do a nearly perfect quantum computation with imperfect parts, to my mind, is actually much more amazing and counterintuitive than the fact that you could do a quantum computation if you had perfect components. The, the superposition and entanglement and the power of quantum information, that's all amazing. But I'll try to explain to you now why quantum error correction and the fact that it can be done is much more amazing. So here's the quantum error correction problem in a nutshell. I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state. Unlike the classical error correction problem, if you look at that bit and see what it is, so you could make some copies of it or protect it in some other way, 
if you look at your quantum state, you're going to randomly change it by this back action, and you're not going to be able to tell what happened in the state collapse. Now here's the task for you. If this unknown state develops an error, please fix it. Seems impossible. <laughs> but in fact, this is the amazing thing. It can be done. There are clever ways to do this that it can be done. So let's think about uh, correcting errors in a known state. That's pretty easy. Suppose Alice gives Bob a spin-up state and says, I'm giving you a spin-up state. And then uh, some uh, error occurs. And there are two kinds of errors, sort of incoherent errors, where the environment flips a coin and decides to change the state of the uh, qubit, maybe flip it. Or some kind of classical noise arrives and, and coherently rotates the spin from one quantization axis to another. Well, right away, you see that quantum errors they're analog, they can be continuous. They're very different from classical errors. Either there was a bit flip or not a bit flip in a, in a classical computer. But here we have this bizarre situation in which we have a coherent superposition of there was no error and there was an error. Well, that in itself is pretty strange. So, uh, so then Bob me decides to measure z because he knows the known state has uh, a z equals plus 1. And as we saw from the previous discussion, Bob will find the result z equals plus 1 with probability cos cosine squared theta over 2. And Bob will say, aha, there was no error. Bob will have no way of knowing whether he actually got this from Alice or he got this, and the back action of his measurement changed the state. So this is kind of a Zeno thing. And it's very simple. If Bob measures that there is no error, there is no error. It's not continuous. There is no error. Now, occasionally, if theta is small, Bob will see a giant error, the complete spin flip with probability sine squared theta over 2. And so the errors are continuous, they're analog, but measured errors are discrete. And that is the key for um, allowing quantum error correction to happen. So th that was for finding errors in a known state. But think about how much more subtle it must be to find and correct errors in an unknown state. That requires subtle artifice, and it's this discreteness of the measured errors that makes this possible. OK, so uh, in order to do quantum error correction on an unknown state, I need to, to take and form a logical qubit out of some number n of physical qubits, let's say 9 in the Shor code. And I need to store one quantum bit of information in a, whoops, in a way which is spread out non-locally amongst these uh, n physical qubits. And by that I mean that no one of the qubits can actually know the state of the logical qubit. Because if it did, the environment may come in and cause an error and measure that qubit and learn something about it, and therefore learn something about the logical qubit. So you have to have a group of people, all of whom are sharing some secret, and none of whom know what it is, and yet it's still there and can be uh, eventually recovered. So we need. Uh, the model is that errors are occurring independently on each of the physical qubits, and we need a Maxwell demon, which is somehow capturing that entropy and pumping it into a cold bath in a way that does not ever find out what the information is that's stored in the logical qubit. 
Now, right away you see there's a problem because if the errors are occurring independently on the n qubits, by storing the information instead of in one, in n, right away I've increased the error rate by a factor of n, let's say nine. So I've lost, my first step is I've taken a giant step backwards, okay? And the Maxwell, whoops, the Maxwell demon has to overcome this factor of n and not introduce any errors of its own. And the Maxwell demon is not gonna be perfect, but in a so-called fault tolerant situation, roughly speaking, the Maxwell demon only introduces categories of error that look like the ones it's trying to fix, and so there's a good chance it'll be fixed in the next round of error correction. So if, if this code can correct any single qubit error, and if the Maxwell demon in pumping out the energy only introduces single qubit errors, you, things are better. But it's, a, but it's actually quite subtle to figure out how something is truly fault tolerant, and you can concatenate uh, logical qubits made of logical qubits and super logical qubits and get the uh, error rate exponentially small. So, um, now, how do we tell if it's actually working? Well, uh, among these nine qubits, there's one that is better than all the others. And you should compare the performance of the logical qubit to that one best one. Otherwise, you're cheating. If you compared it to the worst one, a, a simple <laughs> logical qubit would be to transfer the information to the best one. That's not really what we're talking about. So think about that. Quantum error correction is an emergent phenomenon in which I take one best qubit and I add n minus one worst qubits and the collective effect gives me overall a logical qubit that's better than even the best one, even though I added only worse ones. And that's the job of the demon to use those n minus one worst qubits to make the whole thing better. So um, you're gonna hear in Rob Sholkoff's talk about this idea of uh, using hardware shortcuts. Instead of taking this sort of quantum computer science approach to error correction where we have identical qubits, we form a group of them, we make a logical qubit, we concatenate those into further and further. That gets to a very large part count very quickly. And uh, one idea is to use photons, states of microwave photons to store the quantum information, a qubit to manipulate that, and a readout cavity to read out the qubit as part of the uh, state tomography on this system. And because the cavity has a larger Hilbert space, it's a harmonic oscillator, we can, uh, use that to represent multiple physical qubits and save on part count and simplify uh, the readout to a single axis. So uh, you could imagine storing information, for example, uh, in code words, and the simplest code would be code word one is the vacuum state of the cavity or one photon state. That's the... Um, the analog of the single best component in the system, uh, the single best qubit, because it has the smallest number of photons and the rate of losing photons from the cavity, which is the dominant error, is uh, lowest when you have the fewest photons. But if you lose a photon from here, you're guaranteed to be in the vacuum state and you've lost all the quantum information. Uh, we've recently worked on some codes. The simplest uh, member of that family of codes is just code word is a superposition of zero and four, and the second code word is two. They have the same mean photon number, and if I lose a photon, I get the same coefficient root two in front of each of those states, which means that there's a unitary transformation that can take this back to the original code word, that back to the original code word, and you can recover from photon loss. And this uh, set of codes will uh, more complicated members can tolerate arbitrary losses, gains, and dephasing events if you're willing to handle complicated enough code. 
Uh, and then you'll hear in Rob Sholkoff's talk about using Schrodinger cat states with even numbers of photons as this is one code word, this is another code word, and uh, uh, this turns out to be something that actually works. So we're in the uh, beginnings of moving up towards fault-tolerant computation, moving from operations on single qubits to developing uh, logical qubits and then working towards entangling those logical qubits. And uh, I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be uh, doing this kind of science and engineering. And I thank you very much. And uh, I say happy birthday to John. Let me suggest uh, one question. Um, in the, uh, the, the well-known uh, treatise on the theory of uh, scientific revolutions, it's discussed that a a scientific revolution comes about when there's a true uh, crisis where the former way of describing things becomes increasingly inadequate and one is begrudgingly forced to, uh, to move in a, in a new and otherwise unforeseen direction which then suddenly changes how we see everything uh, thenceforth. So to what extent is this second quantum revolution such a revolution? What, what is the crisis, let's say, that precipitates it and what's the old discussion that is now inadequate? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure it, my first reaction is it doesn't really fit that paradigm in the sense that there, there weren't, well, there were, there were experimental observations, you know, um, bell inequalities and violations and things like that, which were very weird and took time to get used to, but we understood they fit within the existing quantum theory. Nothing had, it's not the kind of revolution where we had to give up on the quantum theory. It's just the revolution in which we understood it uh, much better, I would say. We haven't changed the laws of quantum mechanics. We've realized now that they have implications that the information content of quantum systems is much more subtle and interesting and powerful than we realized. But the, the laws haven't changed. Yes, Holger. Technology, oh, thanks. Hi, technology is advancing and while quantum effects have first been seen in black body radiation and then in atomic systems and so on, we can now engineer quantum systems in all kinds of experimental apparatus. What would you say are the one or two best contenders for rapid future development? So, um, I just was at the ITAMP Winter School yesterday in, uh, in the desert outside Tucson, and Chris Monroe, who's speaking tonight, assuming he manages to get here, maybe he is here. Oh, hey, Chris. <laughs> so I better be careful what I say now he's here. Uh, he suggested that superconducting qubits and ion traps were currently perhaps in the strongest position. I won't disagree with that. I would say, um, NV centers or their analogs, uh, uh, silicon or germanium centers and diamond and so forth uh, are looking interesting. Um, the people doing silicon dots, I thought that was hopeless a few years ago, but now they're doing spin to charge conversions and reading out spin with great efficiency. So I still think, I mean, they're still uh, further behind, but uh, they're making more progress than I thought. Um, so, and as I said, it, it's way too early to uh, pick the winner or pick the winning uh, engineering architecture and just fill in the details. There's uh, opportunities for orders of magnitude improvement coming out of some unexpected uh, direction in left field. I guess, Steve, if I, if I think about the, the first, maybe what we should think of this is not the second quantum revolution, but maybe the second computing revolution. And the advent of, uh, of practical computation was not necessarily brought about by a crisis in the way that people were thinking about things earlier. It was simply a realization that even with faulty components, something universal, to perform universal computation could, uh, could be constructed. So maybe it's more of, of that type which makes it I guess a, a different flavor 
than what we had uh, seen, let's say, when the, f the first quantum revolution came about. Right, and um, the, I mean, there were various crises, you know, in um, electromechanical punch card readers and, and t taking more and more census data, people, there, were, there was a push, there was need for better technology, and certainly the same is, is uh, true today. So we'll, um, we'll, yeah, see what happens.